I'm going to talk about the general relativity gravitational field strength and we're going to do an approximation and that's done by we're going to argue from the redshift. So gravitational field strength. For the Earth everybody's familiar with g, the acceleration due to gravity. So g for the Earth is gm, gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth at the Earth's surface, we'll divide by the radius of the Earth uh, squared, and that gives you the familiar number of 9.81 meters per second squared. So that's the gravitational field strength uh, from Newton. Now, the little trick that we want to try here is this. Recall the definition for the redshift. It's lambda minus lambda zero over lambda zero, where lambda zero is the original wavelength and lambda is the new wavelength. This could be a Doppler redshift, something moving away from you, emitting light at wavelength lambda zero, and when you see it, it's a longer wavelength of lambda. That's a redshift. It might be uh, two galaxies moving apart from one another. The light from the uh, distant galaxy is lambda zero say we're the other galaxy because of the expansion of space it's moving away from us the wavelength of the light moves through the space that's expanding gets stretched has a longer wavelength so we think of the redshift in terms of a cosmological redshift so we have a Doppler redshift and a cosmological redshift but the important point this is the definition for a redshift then there's a gravitational redshift and it's given by 1 over the square root of 1 minus 2 times the gravitational constant times the mass of the object over the distance that we are from the object, could be the radius, and the speed of light c squared minus 1. We can reduce this down to this. And so in terms of the gravitational redshift for the wavelengths, we would wind up with this equation here lambda equals lambda zero times this term here, minus one-half power. And the little trick that we'll play is we're going to change lambda to g and lambda zero to g zero and keep this term. And we're going to associate the g and the g zero now. And by looking at this term here, you can see that what happens as r becomes very large, this term becomes insignificant. So if we're trying to express an equation here for the gravitational field strength, it's, we would have at far distance from the object where the gravitational field isn't strong, we would expect to have Newton's expression. Newton's law of gravitation, um, taking into account we have a unit mass, we take that out. So we have gm over r squared, just like we did here, the Newton part. And then the rest of this is uh, from general relativity. So what we're saying is that the field strength, the gravitational field strength would be given by this expression. And I just want to, we come over here now, look at this part down here. And we ask, what, what is G at the sun's surface, the gravitational um, field strength at the sun's surface? We have the sun's mass. We have the sun's diameter. We can calculate the Newton result to be this number. And we can ca calculate it using this expression and we get this number and you can see the change starts showing up way out here and of course I'm carrying a lot of digits that are not really uh, accurate but I'm just saying the numbers that we're substituting in let's say they're exact numbers so I can carry out a number of digits and you see that you see the change occurring at the sixth digit out and if you did the same thing for the earth it would occur at the eighth digit out. Now how, how can I give you some confidence that this expression is correct? The first thing 
I'm, I'm going to use an example from a text by uh, Kip Thorne. Uh, titled Black Holes and Time Warps by Professor Kip Thorne. He has an example in there and we'll get to that shortly. But first I want to point out that in this expression here we can see that uh, if we had R equal to 2GM over c squared, this would be 1 then, and this would be 0, and the field would go into infinity. Uh, this, this is a definition for the uh, Schwarzschild radius. And uh, the example that we're going to use from Professor Thorne's book involves a black hole. So I just want to say a little bit about the Schwarzschild radius and a black hole. Here I'm showing a view of a black hole in our normal space. It would be a spherical black ball. If you know the mass of that black hole, you could calculate the Schwarzschild radius, which would give you the event horizon, which is defining the surface, well not, not necessarily surface, but this black that you see for the black hole. But the Schwarzschild radius, when you, when you look at the distortion that occurs for space inside the black hole, this is a familiar diagram that you see. It Remember, it represents like an elastic surface. You put a heavy weight into the center of the elastic surface. It stretches down. That gives you the idea of the, of the distortion of space-time caused by a mass. And in the black hole, that mass actually is the singularity down here. But if you look at this, if you look at this as the, the diameter of the black hole, in this hyperspace representation, that's what we call this hyperspace, you can see that the diameter in hyperspace, which would be down here and back up, exceeds the black hole circumference. And the point of saying that is to point out that when we talk about the Schwarzschild radius, it's a little better to think of this radius as giving you the correct circumference around a black hole and not actually giving you uh, the radius one way down or the diameter down and, and back up. All right, so we have this expression and we want to check this using this. Here, Professor Kip Thorne's Black Holes and Time Warps, if you go to page 41, he talks about a huge black hole he calls Gargantua. It has a mass of 15 trillion suns. It has a circumference of 21 light years. That's information he gives you. And he says that if you are thrusting, we're showing the Enterprise here, here's Gargantua, if you're thrusting away at 10 G's, you could remain hovering at 1.001 circumference of Gargantua, or in other words, 1.001 of the radius. So here I'm showing the Enterprise thrusting with an acceleration of 10 Earth G's to remain fixed at this distance of Gargantua's event horizon. And of course the scale here is greatly exaggerated. So he gives us the mass of Gargantua as 15 trillion suns and we're going to convert that to kilograms. We then take that mass and put it in the equation we had over there for the Schwarzschild radius. Schwarzschild radius. And we're going to also convert to light years because he gives us a circumference in light years. So the conversion is one light year over this many meters. And the circumference then would be 2 pi times this radius which gives us 29.38 light years, so good. 
we've got that agreement. The next thing we want to do is uh, eventually get down to what the acceleration is from our expression that we worked that we showed o over there. So we do a substitution into this equa equation to do 2gm over c squared. And we're just going to convert the light years to meters. So after we do that conversion, we say that the radius that we're interested in is 1.001 times that. That's what he gave us here in terms of circumference, but it's the same factor for radius. And it, and it works out to this quantity here. And he expresses the acceleration in terms of Earth g's. So what we'll do, we'll say what the value of g for the Earth is, nine point, roughly 9.81 meters per second squared. And the Newtonian result that we would get, the thrusting that we would say from Newtonian's expression would show that the thrusting would be 0 0.10 earth g's. But that's wrong. If we use the general relativity expression here and do the substitutions, we find out that this expression that we came up with by doing that little trick with uh, the definition of the redshift and the gravitation and using the the term for the gravitational redshift we came up with this and that produces 10.3 g's which is in good agreement with his so i'm just trying to show you that by applying that to an example you get a result that doesn't prove anything but it does give you some confidence in this so the next thing we want to try to do is to apply this to some massive objects to see what the difference looks like between the Newtonian expression and the expression that we're showing for general relativity for the gravitational field strength. So if you come over here now, on this axis we're showing the gravitational redshift units of meters per second squared or newton per kilogram, same. And we're showing it for the supermassive black hole located at the center of our Milky Way, Sagittarius A. And the mass of Sagittarius A is four million, a little over four million suns. We're showing it for Cygnus X1, a black hole that has a mass of 15 suns. And we're also showing it for a white dwarf that has a mass of about one sun. So the, the solid line represents Newton, and the dashed line represents the general uh, relativity result for the expression that we have right here. So that, that curve is, is plotted here, and you can see how it deviates from Newton's law and begins going up. This is the uh, diameter of the uh, supermassive black hole. So you can see it's shooting up to a very large value, basically going to infinity. Uh, what, what the actual G is, if you could actually imagine yourself standing on the event horizon, which you can't do, but if you imagine that, uh, that gets rather conf complicated, but we're, sh we're showing this result to indicate to you that it, the gravitational field goes up very quickly. Now we're not at a short enough of distance to show the same type of effects for both the Cygnus X1 black hole or for the dwarf star. And so down here, if you look down here now, what we've done, if we, we now are showing, oh, our distance here I should say is in astronomical units. So this distance here is 0 0.85 for the diameter of, of the black hole. This astrono astronomical units. One astronomical units is is 499 light seconds, or about 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. So now we're down here, and we're showing this scale now in kilometers, and 
we're, we're showing the diameter for the white dwarf star and for uh, Cygnus X1 respectively 2.88 kilometers and 44 kilometers and again you can see the solid line represents Newton's result and the dashed one represents the uh, general relativity result and you can see you know we, we get the same type of behavior which is what you would expect so if we come back over here this expression that we argued from these steps uh, provides us with with those curves and if we check this against the example in Professor Thorne's book, it looks like it gives the right result. And uh, you can actually find this result if, if you work out the details of uh, Einstein's fuel equations for general relativity. Uh, th this is uh, what, what you will come up with. So this shows a simple way of getting an expression that is accurate but without going through all the great uh, difficulty it's not really that hard but uh, this is far easier but perhaps less convincing than than the actual development of the equation from Einstein's equation so that's the story on that